Growing up, I was always into off-roading and 4x4 recreation of any kind. A couple of years ago, I was dating a lady, and she got me convinced that we needed a Razor, one of those side-by-side off-road golf carts. I've always liked them, and I've always thought they were kind of badass. All I needed was a little encouragement to get one inside my garage. Well, when we bought it, it was all the rage in my family. My folks loved it. My brother and sister thought it was super cool, and everyone mentioned it every time they spoke to me. It became commonplace for me to be giving someone a ride at least once a week, whether it was my uncle, my girlfriend's family, or whoever was close and just wanted to go for a spin. Honestly, I loved that thing. It was loud, it turned heads, and I blacked the whole thing out so it looked like a Batmobile. My nieces and nephews really liked that part. As for me, I was doing a lot more off-roading now than ever, so much so that I started exploring lots of places, offshoots that splintered off into the Blue Ridge Parkway. If that part didn't give it away, I live in South Carolina. One of these trails really piqued my interest, as the trail network was complex and the wilderness was dense, and I felt like there was maybe some old, potentially undiscovered Indian sites out there. I was spending more and more time rooting around, driving from ridge to ridge, seeing what there was to see. I got a call from my sister one week. She asked if she could drop her son off at my house, who at the time was about two years old. His name is Josh, and I was the on-call babysitter. Josh and I got along great. He was a little picky about who he spent his time with, so whenever my sister needed a minute, she would call and just dump him off at my place. My girlfriend and I, Tara, were just getting ready to go hit the hills, and I told this to my sister, who said that that was fine. Josh would love to go bounce around in the Batmobile. I wasn't against this, as I stated prior. I love giving my friends and family a ride in the Razor, And yes, before you get too concerned, I had multiple car seats that I could install in the back. They're called bump seats. I had a couple for different ages and sizes. Josh rode in the little one and absolutely loved it. We got out to my stretch of the woods, started bumping around the trails. Just easy at first, but soon I was doing wild vertical climbs. Josh was squawking and laughing the entire time in the back. Even Tara was screaming like we were on a roller coaster, arms in the air and everything. The trail eventually forked, and I had only explored the eastern path. The little bramble trail that went off to the left was totally foreign to me, and wanted to keep up the good time, so I chose to go that way this time. It would keep the terrain fresh and exciting, force me to make some good off-road maneuvers. Little did I know, I was driving into one of the worst nightmares of my entire life. The trail led up and over a hillside, then dropped into a little rolling valley. I could see the trails crisscrossing in every direction. Trees flanked us on all sides, and down at the bottom, a little water glistened back up at us. I couldn't tell if it was flowing or just a pond, but either way, I was excited to find some new terrain. I hit the pedal and dropped us deeper into the valley. All in all, it was a great day. We kept exploring and found some neat stuff before finally deciding to break for lunch. I found a nice flat spot in the clearing, and when I killed the engine, I could hear the murmur of a creek nearby. Birds and bugs made all kinds of noises around us. Josh clapped and cooed at all of it. The place itself was serene, so I set up some chairs, a little table, and all the snacks that we had brought. This would be our little hangout spot until we got bored and wanted to keep moving on. Tara loved chilling out in the deep woods, and Josh and I liked pedaling around on foot, looking at rocks and minerals. Maybe we'd even find an arrowhead. Everything happened so quickly. I distinctly remember playing with Josh, chasing him around the clearing. Then we all settled down for a snack and then went back to playing. We were talking while playing with Josh, so I got distracted for just a moment. It couldn't have been more than a minute. We were both looking around and asking each other where the kid was. We could actually hear him stomping around, so at first we didn't panic. He had to be close. Even so, Neither of us could get an eye on this kid for like 15 minutes. As we were moving around and searching, shouting his name, the sweats start to come and go. We start to panic a little. I mean, what the hell? Why can't we find him? I start thinking about the conversation I had with my sister. Yeah, we went outside and all of a sudden he was gone. I just turned around and boom, couldn't find him. I'm sure he's out there somewhere and we'll get a call soon. All of a sudden, he was gone. That phrase was ringing in my head so loud that I could hardly see. 
It wasn't that I lost my own child, but someone else's. I would have to explain this to someone and hope they understand if they didn't get it figured out quickly. Hey! Tara screamed. I, I think I see him. I went barreling through the brush, got my face and clothes all scratched to hell just so I could follow her voice more closely. I saw where Tara was looking. Sure enough, there was Josh. He had his back to us and he was walking in the other direction. Like I said, Josh was barely two at the time, but he was very mobile. He had these little boots that he could run in, and even now, he was putting some ground behind him. I kicked it up a notch. Now that I could see him, this was my chance to put my anxiety to bed and correct this whole situation. I fought through the brush and brambles until finally, I reached out and snagged his little flannel. He bowed and then fell on his little butt, snapped and looked back up at me. Hey, little man, I said. What are you doing back here? Mom, he said, then pointed into the woods. No, your mom is back home. It's just me and Aunt Tara out here, I explained. No, mom, he said again. I shook my head and laughed, and just as I did, I just happened to look up. There was a person out in the trees, not 20 feet from us. She was standing behind a big thick trunk, poking out to look at us. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. At first, I thought it was hallucinating. My legs started to get loose and wobbly as I had two realizations. One, this was obviously why Josh was saying, Mom, there was a woman out here. And two, she had to have been luring him out into the forest. Why else would he have been running away from us so fast? I was in a complete state of shock. I hardly noticed that Josh had wiggled out of my grasp and resumed his mission toward this weirdo. She saw him walking, so she slipped out from behind the tree and started approaching him. I watched in disbelief as this woman bent down, scooped Josh up beneath her arms, and hoisted him onto her shoulder. Her eyes then shot to me. She smiled and then started darting through the trees. Josh was laughing, none the wiser to what was really going on. Hey! I finally barked. I turned but Tara was there tearing through the bushes like a banshee. She had been coming up from behind me, just in time to see what happened, and so sprang into action. I sized up the woman in front of us, who honestly wasn't gaining any ground. She was clearly crazy, probably homeless of some kind, and just found herself drifting on the trails. It's not that uncommon in the area. Some strange people end up in the backcountry. There was a problem, though. Tara went around one side of the tree, and I went around the other, we flanked that gal, forced her to stop. Josh didn't seem as entertained now. He could see the panic on our faces. He started to squirm and resist, and even began to cry a little bit. The hell are you doing, lady? I barked at her. What are you doing out here? Nothing. I thought he was lost, she replied. I could tell by the shifty look in her eyes that she was full of it. I didn't want him lost out here. She set Josh on the ground at this point. He walked over to Tara and climbed up into her arms. She began taking steps backward toward the clearing where we left the razor. You hiking or even camping? I asked. The woman just laughed and then nodded. There's total craziness in this lady's eyes. Like they almost felt black. I'm going back to our day camp and I'm calling the police. If you're still out here when they arrive, it's the end of the road for you. Get it? He said. It was a bold threat, especially for being in the middle of nowhere. This woman wasn't phased in the slightest, though. She actually mocked me. With that, she turned and then wandered off in the direction of the creek. I assumed she had to be a drifter and had some kind of camp set up along the waterway. She probably used it to go back and forth between the nearby town, where she could loot dumpsters and steal who knows what. We hightailed it out of there, barely packed up all of our supplies. We made sure to strap Josh in first thing, so he couldn't wander off or be lured off again by someone. Tara and I threw everything in the razor and hit those trails back to the main road. In the rear view, I swear to God, I saw that same woman lurking along the tree line. She was alone, smiling, then offered a single wave before disappearing back over the ridge of the hill. I told my sister a very loose version of these events, to which she was just relieved that it turned out to be nothing. 
I've been extra careful since that incident. And if you're off-road anywhere in South Carolina, look out for child abducting weirdos deep, deep in the wilderness. My brother and I are competitive when it comes to just about everything. Racing, lifting, fighting, drinking, you name it, we'll argue about it. Neither of us are the best at any of this stuff though. We just want to be better than the other. Kevin, my brother, is older than me by four years. One thing we always took seriously was hunting and fishing. We grew up doing it and it really became ingrained in us. We'd always relish in the days when one of us would get a kill or a catch and the other didn't. It was almost like a true testament of our manhood. Silly boy stuff, I know, but it was part of growing up, and it made us better to whatever we put our minds to. Well, later on in life, we went our different ways, and for a long time, too. At one point, though, I had an opportunity to move out to Colorado, to a town that was near where Kevin lived. I decided, what the hell? When else would I get an opportunity like this? I made that leap, and we were catching up in no time. I moved during the summer, just before fall, so deer season was coming up quick. My brother asked me if I had any plans to hunt this year. I had just moved here, didn't know anything about the area. I'd only scouted a couple of places to fish, but hadn't even cast a line yet. Kevin told me it was done and done. He went hunting every year, I had a routine that he went by. It was a perfect excursion to break into the local wildlife. I said I was looking forward to it, I would have my gear ready. Well, the season came and we went on Kev's ritual retreat. It started with a 90 minute boat ride that snaked to the very back of this reservoir. The front edge of the water was trafficked pretty well by the locals, but the rest of the lake could only be explored if you had a boat. The canyon walls didn't provide a shore, just a steep wall with thick tree stands. Once you got past that first dam, things would start to open up. The water turned from a narrow pond to a big, beautiful lake and the forest flattened out, offered more mannered of hiking areas. All of it was secluded. Secret to us though. There were a few fishermen with boats here and there, but most of them seemed to linger near the dam, or even go in the other direction, entirely from the launch dock. The further back that we went, the less and less of people that we saw. Eventually, the reservoir narrowed up again, and the water started to get shallow. We were coming to the back end of the water, just as Kevin planned. We came around a bend to find this little rocky shore where the water petered out. The shore led up to a steep embankment and beyond that, what looked like an endless trees. It was quiet, secluded, perfect for a week away. We immediately began divvying out our equipment and buck up the hillside and into those trees. Kevin said there was a clearing for camp just at the top. I grabbed my tent bag and started to shoulder the strap. Ah, oh, come on, man. Kevin pestered. You need to sleep in a lunchbox at night? I'm just packing what you brought, dude, I explained. Well, Kevin said, there isn't supposed to be any weather this week. It's just a precaution. I arched an eyebrow. What do you say we leave the tent in the boat? Rough it for old time's sake, he asked. I nodded. Sounds like fun. First one to bitch out has to cook the rest of the trip, I added. We shook hands and started that first slog up the hill. I just took my pack, my bedroll, and a rifle that first trip. I wasn't sure what we would find waiting for us at the top. It was honestly unbelievable. Kevin had built a roughneck campsite out of logs and timber that he whittled with axes and a chainsaw. There was a table, chairs, and more chairs around a massive fire pit. There was a shelving system between a trio of trees, and even a bathroom post deeper in the thicket. It was one of the most impressive campsites that I've ever seen, still to this day. Seeing that it was secure, I dumped off my stuff and went back for the rest. After two trips each and four trips total, we shouldered everything up that ridge and into the campsite. Next, we set to the chores, gathering firewood, splitting logs, and getting the kitchen set up. Kevin even had a speaker system that he hung from some trees to play music when he felt like it. The first day was entirely just for chores, and after six hours of getting everything in place, the sun was going down, starting to cool off. We had a healthy campfire going, which we had our feet up by as we drank our first of many beers. We cooked up some brats, some chili, and ate like kings in those big hand-carved chairs that Kevin had made himself. 
with the stars shining up above me and the tall trees dancing in the firelight, it almost felt like a movie. I was so at peace. I forgot that we were even out there to do anything except relax. Being so disarmed with the beauty and the conversation, neither of us noticed the clouds blowing in, nor the dip in the temperature. Drinking six or seven beers probably didn't help either. So when we crawled up into our sleeping bags by the fire that night, we had no idea what we were in for. It was light at first, just enough to make me roll over and pull the bag up over my head. By the time it woke me up, it was at a full downpour. Everything was getting soaked. I looked up and could see Kevin's sleeping form. I could actually hear him snoring through the patter of rain. Dude, wake up, it's pouring, I yelled. He snapped upright immediately. Noah in a piss pot, he yelled back. How long has it been raining? I don't know, man, we gotta find some cover though. We both hopped up and did the first logical thing, got some lights going. Kev fired up a pair of lanterns and I got us some flashlights. He happened to have a tarp in the box that he kept there at the camp, so we grabbed that and set the strap it amongst some trees. After we got that hanging, we scrambled up to get everything underneath it, all of our supplies and equipment. We were getting soaked to the bone, but at least our sleeping bags had a place to get out of the rain. Meanwhile, the coals in the fire hissed beneath the downpour, and smoke sizzled up and filled the whole clearing. I remember it feeling really ominous, but I don't really know why. Anyway, after we got everything that we could out of the rain, we decided it was time to get the tent. Kev told me to run down there and start unloading it. He'd come and meet me in a minute. He wanted to get his speakers down before they were totally ruined. I worked my way through the trees and got out of the slope that led me down to the boat. The hillside was lit up by a silver moonlight. Plus the flashlight I had, I could see the boat pulled ashore, as well as everything inside it. There's something else though, down there standing before the lip of the boat. It was an inky black figure. Definitely had to be a man, but just hard enough to make out otherwise. He was going through our stuff, as well as dragging the boat out into the water. I blinked and rubbed the rain out of my eyes. I couldn't believe it. As I looked on, I realized whoever was down there was huge. They looked to be shy of seven feet tall. The boat my brother had was a pretty good size too and with the added weight of the leftover equipment inside, it weighed quite a bit. This person was manhandling the thing by the shore, all by themselves, no issue. A very large and very strong person. Why they needed the boat, I have no idea. Hey! Hey! I screamed down the hill, going through the lightning in the rain. Get the hell out of here! In my pocket was the micro 9mm which I pulled and pointed right at our midnight visitor. They reacted the moment that I yelled, and I could finally get a look at them. Whatever they were wearing was black from the rain, maybe jeans and a flannel, or even a pullover sweater. They had tons of hair, bearded, almost like they lived out in the woods. Honestly, it kind of looked like a miner from the old black and white photos that you see. Black eyes and big bushy beard, ashy looking. He dropped the boat and started scrambling across the rocks, walking in a really bizarre way, arms outstretched overhead, as if he had no balance, hopscotching from one stone to the next. Maybe he had no shoes on or something. All I know is that it looked super weird to me. Then he darted off into the brush and disappeared. Kevin came up behind me with the flashlight and scanned the slope himself. What's going on, man? He asked. There's somebody down here messing with our boat. You ever see people out here before? I asked. Messing with the boat? There's no one out here, dude. We're miles and miles from any kind of parking lot. He pulled out his 357. We began the slow descent to the boat, using the flashlights to scan for any sign of that tall guy. We no longer saw him, and I kept relaying what I'd seen to Kevin. He didn't really believe me. I could tell, which in retrospect I understood, but damn, if it didn't bug me to no end. I know what I saw, but because of the nature of our relationship, he thought I was messing with him. Look man, I've never been out here, and I've got my gun drawn, I explained. I'm not pulling your leg on this, there was somebody down here with me. I gestured to the boat as we made it all the way down. Look at it, somebody moved it a good six feet back from the shore. That was true, 
The thing was in a totally different position from where we left it, and the gear inside was thrown helter-skelter, like someone had thrown it around. Kevin then squinted through the rain and nodded. All right, he said, let's just get the tent set up. We unloaded what we needed and started the slog back up the hill. It was only a couple of feet, but the steep incline made it an ass kicker, as well as the rain making the terrain unstable. We split the gear between us and slung it over our shoulders so we could keep sweeping the area with our flashlights. Nothing came out, but some jaw-dropping lightning hit the place up and gave us a great couple of seconds to inspect it all. No tall guy lurking in the trees, much to our relief. Kev also made a point to tie up the boat, now that he thought maybe there was somebody out there. We woke up and it was gone, we'd be in some serious trouble trying to get back. We got up to the clearing and started setting up the tent beneath the cover of the tarp. This way we could keep it dry while we got it structured. After it was secure, we moved it out so only the entrance was underneath the tarp. Then we started funneling our sleeping stuff inside the tent. Next, we got a secondary fire going beneath that tarp, but in a dry place where it could ventilate the smoke around the flap. It was tiny, just enough to start drying our boots and our clothes out. It was going to be a slow process, so we fired up the cooking unit and got a pot of coffee going as well. Whatever sleep that we gotten was what we got, as the list of chores for that morning were now long. Plus, I think deep down we both wanted to keep an eye out for that guy snooping around the boat. My brother never thought there could be a person out there so far without a boat of some kind of their own. The rain stopped the next morning. The sun came out to burn off a lot of the excess cloud cover. We were tired, but camp was now secure. We even tapped into a cache of dry wood that Kevin had stored in a rock outcropping. Things were dry, we had some food, and we had cover from the dripping canopy above us. It wasn't ideal, but we were prepared and adapted. So much for no rain, I said. Yeah, he commented. To hell with it, though. Let's go hunting. We set out that first morning and found a whole lot of nothing. There were tracks everywhere, overlapping in every direction, but the rain had washed them out too bad for us to be able to tell what they were. Some were obvious, and those tracks weren't anything that we were trying to kill. There was a gully that took us back into a meadow. Kevin said it was good for deer. We followed it back and got high up on the hillside, spent an hour or two casing the clearing and watching for any signs. No luck. But there was something north of us. We could both hear it. Nothing else to do and needing to head back to camp soon, we decided to just go take a look. The meadow got narrow again and then turned into a gulch that snaked back into the forest. As we moved into the pass, a breeze pushed past us and it carried the smell of death with it. One of the worst smells that I've ever encountered and it stopped me dead in my tracks. I turned back and looked at Kevin. He put a bandana over his nose. His eyes were wide. He was now shaking his head, too. Uh, any idea? I asked. No, he admitted. I have no idea what the hell is going on. Something dead is back here, dude, I said. No shit, Kevin confirmed. He nodded backward, signaling us to turn back for camp, and I followed his lead. But I couldn't help looking over my shoulder. I couldn't place the noise still, nor that smell. I guess, but I knew it was all off. There was something weird about all of it. Neither of us talked much on the way back to camp, still on the lookout potentially for any deer in the area. Or just on the lookout for something, I guess. That smell really put me off. I've never had any kind of experience like that in the wild. Then add that shadowy weirdo that we saw the night before. I was just about ready to break camp and take the boat ride home. When we got back to camp, Kevin gave me the breakdown. It was a den of some kind, predator territory. Since I've been gone since the last season, something must have moved in and started dragging kills back there. Who knows what it could be, but the air was heavy back there, man. Still, I've been in mountain lion country before, and the area had that same kind of energy. You could cut the air with a knife it's so thick. Bugs aren't even making a sound. It all made sense to me. One whiff and I was all locked up. I wanted to run in the other direction instinctually. We started up a fire and got dinner going, then cracked the first beers of the afternoon. As we hung out and cooked, the sun dropped and the darkness came unnaturally fast. We both noticed how dark it was. 
even mentioned it to each other. It's almost like you brought me somewhere cursed, man. I choked. Ah, this place is one of the best. It's just been a weird week. Kevin reflected. We ate and put our boots up by the fire. The trees all but vanished into the black maw of the sky. Not a single star penetrated the eerie cloud cover. Even the campfire seemed to struggle to stay alight. The darkness chewed away at the glow around us. It was almost like the canyon was trying to swallow us itself. And then it started. A rain of a different kind. At first a rock, then a pine cone. Rock, acorn, another pine cone. All kinds of crap started sailing out of the darkness and landing at our feet or in the fire. We lit those trees up with the flashlights, but there wasn't anybody. We watched in complete disbelief as projectiles came flying out of the tops of the trees, as if someone climbed up and was just throwing it from there. Maybe it's raccoons, Kevin said, shaking his head. There aren't ever campers this deep, so they don't know what to do. They're throwing stuff to ward us off, he reasoned. I didn't buy it, but it was a theory. I mean, I could see right in front of me that whatever was throwing the stuff was somewhat small and could climb a tree. We couldn't see it from its perch, so whatever it was. We did the one thing that we could do, send a few rounds into the air around us. One with a 30-30 and a bunch with my 9mm. It got our ears ringing, but also served to stifle whatever was tossing that stuff at us. At least for a little bit. After dinner and then close to bedtime, stuff began flying into camp again. We didn't want to get our hearts going again with any gunfire, so we just decided to turn in for the night. We kept flashlights and handguns inside the tent, very near just in case, but it didn't matter. All through the night, there was a pitter-patter against the nylon of the tent, as random stuff bounced off the sidewall. When we awoke the next morning, there was a pile of pine cones and acorns lying on the ground beside the tent. We got up early and decided to just get right into the hunt. Murdered a quick pot of coffee, nitro as we like to call it, and we used the double amount of grounds you should. Didn't add anything else. We got our boots on and moved off into the forest. Kevin took us in a different direction this time, away from the gully in the meadow. We walked along the basin, then a steep foothill. There were mushrooms growing everywhere, thick, red, gummy ones that I knew were toxic. I've read that death by mushrooms is particularly awful, so I made sure to give them a wide berth any time I came upon any. And then we saw what we were after. A group of muleys moved through a tree line. Kevin immediately took a knee, shouldered his rifle, and dialed his sight in. I didn't even have time to get my hearing protection on before he took a shot and dropped a healthy buck at about 300 yards. There was plenty of time left in the day, so we didn't break our necks trying to get the deer cleaned. We took our time skinning and making the initial cuts, then removing all the organs. Only after it was empty could we butcher it properly and then take it back to camp. While we worked though, I started to get that weird feeling again. And sure enough, just as we were starting to pull the organs out, I heard a weird sound. I can't really describe it other than like a strange whooshing sound. My brother and I both stop, take a look around, and we spot the opening of a cave maybe 15 yards from us. I guess it really wasn't a cave, more like a big mouse hole in the base of some rocks. It was maybe as big around as a chimney chute, laid horizontally into the stone. It was dark and tapered back at a slight angle, sloping deeper and deeper into the earth. Somewhere far back in that hole was where the sound was emitting. Subtle, but slowly speeding up. Kevin had no idea what to make of it, and neither did I. And then the smell came. The exact same scent of death from the meadow the day before. It was uncanny, and it put Kevin on edge instantly. He just kept shaking his head, looking around, asking himself over and over, what the hell? I could tell this was all out of place. He spent many, many seasons rooting around this area. Never had anything so strange happen to him like this. It's like your curse, dude, he said to me as we butchered the last of the deer. We had the majority of it loaded onto Kevin's pack, as it was his kill. He'd do the honor of hauling it all back to camp. Uh, no, I think you just brought me to a bunk hunting unit, I explained. Then we both turned to the mouth of the cave. It wasn't movement, it wasn't a push of air. 
We heard a voice. No doubt about it. It caught me so off guard that I actually turned on my knee as I was on the ground when I heard it. I started to crawl over to the entrance of that chasm. Yo, what the hell are you doing? Kevin said. I want to know what this is, man. Quit being a bitch. I bellied over and pulled out some of the leaves away from the opening. It was deep, far deeper than I anticipated. I was expecting a little den. Maybe a coyote or a badger would come out and run. I shined a light into the darkness and found the chasm so deep that I couldn't even see the end. The whole time, that whooshing sound got louder and louder. Kevin came up behind me, pistol drawn, and asked me what I saw. Before I could even answer, we heard a voice. We both moved backwards so fast that we tripped each other up. I rolled backwards and into some brush. My brother fell on his ass against a tree. We were both expecting someone to come crawling out of that cave. That's how close that voice sounded. Alright, what the hell, man? I asked. Let's just get back to camp, was all Kevin said. We didn't waste any more time breaking the deer down, packed it up and started huffing back to camp. The late morning transitioned into the afternoon. The sun drifted by overhead. Clouds threatened to roll in a storm, so we kept one foot in front of the other, just in case it was going to rain again. The whole hike we didn't hear a single animal, not a bird or a bee. The wind didn't even dare disturb the stillness of that area. It was creepy as hell. Since he tagged out, we cut the hunting trip short for that season, just because everything was just so creepy. We lingered that night, drank some beer, and theorized what was happening in those woods, but neither of us had a really good theory. Too many weird things were happening for us to be able to account for it all. It was a long, quiet night. We put the deer meat in an airtight cold box, then strung it up in a tree to keep the bears away, or whatever predator was lurking out there. We went to bed and had an uneventful night of sleep. Broke everything down in camp the following morning. It didn't take long, and soon everything was carried over the lip and down onto the boat. We get back to the parking lot, load everything up, and didn't have any more issues. We never heard any more about people lurking out there in the woods, and the strange smell that didn't follow us home. I will say this though, the deer that Kevin killed wasn't good. The meat wasn't spoiled, but all of it tasted bad. It didn't even taste like deer. He ended up throwing it all away. He never went back to that area either, despite having so many years and many hours invested in making it what it was. The strangeness of the time that he took me out there put him off from ever wanting to go back out there. We still both go hunting, but we make sure to do it in less extreme areas, or if something happens, we might be able to get help to us. We just had one weird trip is all. My roommate and I didn't really handle COVID very well. We had way too much free time on our hands. Add to the fact that all the businesses were closed meant that there was literally nothing for us to do. We started walking from one side of the town to the other, soon that led to exploring the little green belts in between neighborhoods, then finally, full-fledged hiking. We basically lived in the woods during quarantine. We'd spend the days out there storm or shine, drinking beers, picking up trash, swimming, just goofing around. We started doing something that sounds odd to say out loud, but at the time, kept us really sane. We'd get into the woods, strip off our socks and shoes and hike in silence to this little lagoon we'd lay out at. It was insanely meditative, and I absolutely loved just barefoot wandering. It felt satisfying in this primal sort of way. So anyway, the more we roamed like that, the more in tune that we got with the woods around us. Without the chatter between us and the careless stomping of booted feet, we'd become part of the woods in this weird kind of way. It also definitely helped that I was stoned out of my mind half the time. We'd end up surprising people pretty often without even meaning to, passing within a couple of feet before they even noticed us. It was like our guts started calling the shots. We could feel storms brewing. All the creatures seemed to stop minding us when we walked like that. So whenever the woods went silent, we knew something was coming. It was one of those days, thick skies and that kind of electricity in the air. It had been stormy for a few days, 
and the woods were all but empty. We'd only seen maybe two other souls all day long. Darkness had started to creep in, quicker than normal. We were headed out of the woods, barefoot and knocking back the dregs of some warm, shitty beer, chatting about absolutely nothing. I remember we were coming up this hill, then all of a sudden it was like I'd swallowed a snowball. I looked up at my friend and she was frozen mid-laugh. Something was wrong. The woods were off. We were surrounded by murky shadows. Dead fucking silence. Heavy silence. Tense silence. Then we heard it. It was this metallic sort of sound. A kind of clanging that we couldn't really make out. Metal striking stone over and over, a bit further down the trail, squarely in between us and the way out. We both stood like statues, tucked behind some trees, just listening. It was a shovel. Someone was digging. As we crept closer, I remember how the sound made my palms itch. My friend's face was flushed rose red. I told myself that I was just being stupid. In fact, inside my backpack, I had a little spade that we used to plant flowers and dig up rocks and such. Who was I to even judge this person? But then again, that was just a little garden spade. As we got closer, it became clear that this person had a full-on shovel and was digging in the middle of the trail. I kept trying to explain it to myself. This person was just digging. Sure, it was a dusk and a lightning storm, and it was hastening our way out, but we all cope with quarantine differently, I suppose. Sure, it's odd to carry a big shovel this deep into the woods, but maybe they're burying a beloved pet. And sure, that really doesn't make sense that they'd bury their pet in the middle of the trail, but maybe they're digging a bike jump. And yeah, maybe they don't have a bike, but on and on and on like that. My mind churning out all these reasons and scenarios. All the while, the knots in my gut wouldn't loosen. We were almost upon them now, and I'm pretty sure it was a him, though they were wearing a hat, scarf, and heavy clothes. All black. Bit odd for summer. But again, he might be mourning his sweet Fido, who would love that spot in the middle of nowhere in a dirt trail. With every step, my stomach hurt more. We were both shining in sweat, and that sound of metal striking earth and stone seemed to be deafening. It's almost a primal sort of fear, isn't it? Rooted deep within our guts, completely deaf to every excuse that I was handing it. We were just waltzing along one minute, cracking jokes and slugging beer. Then suddenly, it was like every neuron was firing, every muscle tight enough to snap. My mind was racing, and I was taking stock of everything around me. Two girls, barefoot, in swimsuits and overalls, two empty beer cans. I had a bag found of trash and a backpack of random shit. My friend was holding out our bucket of rocks, though we picked some skinny flat ones for skipping, not self-defense. I had a can of pepper spray buried somewhere in my bag, but much to my mother's dismay, I'll bet, I couldn't easily access it. It feels so insane looking back now. I've never even been in a fight. I've never even raised my voice. I spent most of my days talking to toddlers about emotional regulation. And yet here, suddenly I was, tallying up what I had on hand that could be used as a weapon against a total stranger. All those excuses that I'd fashioned for him had fallen away and only one of them stuck. Maybe this gut feeling is wrong. Maybe he's doing any one of a million things. Maybe he'd feel awkward or embarrassed seeing us bolt away. But what if that feeling is right? What is the cost if it's right? If we walk past and he swings that shovel, what then? What would those excuses cost us? Something shifted. I really don't know what. It felt like a high voltage situation. A single spark in a gas choked room. My friend went white and the first words that we exchanged the whole time, don't look at him, just run. We ran, crashed down into the woods and off the trail, close to the water. We could jump in if he chased us. We sprinted, leaping over boulders, ducking under trees, thorns and stones sticking into bare soles. I didn't even feel them, didn't notice the blood on my feet till we broke out of the tree line. There's nobody behind us. Whoever we stumbled upon hadn't given us any kind of chase. And that was good because we were still clinging to the hope that whatever they were doing was totally normal. We lingered by that tree line in the buffer between the forest and the town, waited to see if he'd come out. He never did. 
We caught our breath and walked a more mild speed on our way back home. Later on, we tried to piece it all together, try to understand what happened. We were cucumber cool ordinarily and definitely felt a sense of invincibility sneaking around those woods. It wasn't until we were home and safe and bandaging our feet that we figured it out. As far as we ever could, at least. The spark had been silence. He'd been shoveling. And safe at home, I admitted that I'd look back. Just a glance for a split second. He did stop shoveling, and he did start walking toward us. When he stopped shoveling and turned, I could see the rest of his tools scattered in the dirt around him. He had a shovel, but there was a little handpick too, and a five-gallon bucket with all kinds of odds and ends hanging out of it. There was a stained wad of sheets resting beside the bucket. It was wrapped around something, but as to what, I'll never be sure. The sheets itself were dingy, discolored, and absolutely disgusting looking. Whatever the case, my roommate and I got out of there, and we never saw that man again. We went back into the woods, but nothing weird popped up. Even the place that he was digging at returned to the same stillness as before. Neither of us had the guts to try to unearth whatever he was burying. So whatever it was, is still sitting out there, hidden beneath the ground. There are few places more out of the way than McCarthy, Alaska. Over 200 miles east of Anchorage, the hyper-rural community stands as a testament to the fortitude of the human psyche. There is no easy way in or out of the bush. Temperatures can fluctuate well over 100 degrees during the seasons. Summers get as high as 90, and winters plummet to over 50 degrees below zero. It's located smack dab in the middle of Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve. The park itself is six times larger than Yellowstone. The magnitude of this wilderness is lost on those who haven't seen it. Millions of acres, endless forest, and four individual mountain ranges that come together in the park to form nine of the 16 highest peaks in the country. The average snowfall is around 52 inches per year. This isn't just rough backcountry, it's some of the most unforgiving terrain in the entire world. What brought settlers to such a nowhere destination was the discovery of copper high in the ridges of the foothills. Kennecott was founded, then its sister township of McCarthy, but neither community would survive very long. The ore quickly depleted, the price of copper plummeted, so both the mine and the town were abandoned. Even the railroad that carried the copper from the mine to the refinery succumbed to disrepair. Besides the railroad, airplanes were a common method of travel in and out of McCarthy, like many other rural Alaskan towns. There was also an old gravel road that led from McCarthy to the next town, over 60 miles of washboards and culverts. Either way, no one lives there anymore. But in 1983, McCarthy was home to 22 citizens. The road wasn't used as much, as a major flood had washed out the bridge on the east end of the road. Between locals and the state departments, no effort has ever been made to rebuild the bridge. So the only way in by land was by way of the hand-powered tram. McCarthy, Alaska was a place people could go to be alone. Everyone there was antisocial in their own way. Hell, they lived hundreds of miles away from the next major population center. It took a unique individual to call such a place home, mostly survivor types. People who genuinely wanted to live in balance with nature, build their own structure, cut their own firewood, hunt their own food, everything by the book. Maxine Edwards and her husband Jimmy were two such homesteaders living in the Kennecott Valley. They stayed in their own cabin just west of the Kennecott River, which they built themselves in 1953. Each spouse was 52 years old and a perfect dichotomy of a McCarthy resident. Maxine was known as diligent by the locals in the area. She could be seen working her property for up to 10 to 12 hours a day. It wasn't uncommon for Maxine to use a bulldozer all afternoon, only to have a dinner party with linen and crystal by nightfall. The Edwards were tough, rugged Alaskan homesteaders who knew what it took to survive in the seasons out in the middle of nowhere. 
The Heglins were two more McCarthy homesteaders who had lived in Alaska for 27 years. They moved to McCarthy in 1967, where they learned the community didn't have a post office of any kind. Once a week, an airplane would fly into McCarthy, bringing the mail and grocery orders. So if a person wasn't there for pickup on that specific day, their mail and goods would be sent back and brought again next week. It was very inconvenient, but served as a way of life for those in McCarthy. The Heglins had a solution though. They built an addition on the front of their home, complete with a cubby storage system, then hauled the unclaimed mail and goods back to their house. They would put all the stuff in the appropriate cubby, whoever the stuff belonged to, and that person could come pick it up at any time. The outbuilding wasn't insulated, so cold goods would stay frozen, and it didn't have a lock, so locals could just pick up their stuff, even in the middle of the night. Over the decades, McCarthy residents came to consider the Heglins the unofficial postmasters of the village. They served McCarthy in other ways too. The Heglins had a small meteorological site at their home, wherein they would make weather observations and relay them to the FAA flight service station in Cordova, Alaska. Being in such an outlier position, this was valuable weather information for air traffic teams all over the sea. The Heglins had the only two-way radio in the area, powerful enough to get over the mountains of Wrangell St. Elias. Without their radio, McCarthy was totally cut off from the rest of the world. Harley King had lived in Alaska almost his entire life. He worked as a wolf hunter in the Predator Control Program, wherein he had quotas to fill in the wild Alaskan bush. He worked alongside another guide, a man named Jay Hammond, who would go on to become the governor of Alaska during his career. After hunting one of the most dangerous predators, Harley transitioned into boat work and became a commercial fisherman out of Cordova. This was just as dangerous. Fighting with nets and rope and rigging in a storm can lead to an accident, even drowning. The seas get rough and capsize boats all the time. To retire as an Alaskan fisherman is no small feat. When Harley retired, he moved with his wife into the isolation of McCarthy. He liked to hunt ride a snowmobile, and live hermetically, away from the buzz of townships. Harley and Joe King lived on a homestead just 15 miles west of McCarthy, tucked into the quiet backcountry. Two newlyweds had just married back in the lower 48 and returned to their newly completed cabin in the McCarthy area. They were Tim and Amy Nash. Tim had lived in McCarthy for seven years, but had originally moved there with a different woman. During the construction of their cabin, Tim had gone through a divorce and decided to work on his trade as a construction worker and finish his own home. While improving his craft and saving money and making progress on his cabin, he just so happened to meet a woman, Amy, who was a tourist passing through McCarthy. Tim and Amy hit it off and were married and living in the cabin not much later. Again, this isn't a place where you just fall backwards into a rental. No one lives here by chance. There is no housing market, no real estate office. And if you live in McCarthy, you build your own home, install your own electric wiring if you have it, the whole nine yards. Louis D. Hastings was another resident of McCarthy. He was originally a computer program at Stanford University, but was growing rapidly disillusioned with the life in the city. The huge industrial developments were suffocating to Lou, who decided his lifestyle wasn't working for him and sought to venture somewhere new. By 1980, him and his wife had decided on Alaska and moved into a duplex on the east side of town. Lou kept up with the industry that he was in, opened up a computer services company that had ran out of his home. Despite his involvement with technology, his experiences in the city of California had soured any positive looks that he may have had for it. Lou wanted to be somewhere where technology didn't matter, life without it and future development would be non-existent. Instead, what he found was Alaska in the throes of a big business boom, particularly Anchorage. This was partially due to the opening of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. It was an $8 billion investment, a service line over 800 miles long. It would be responsible for relocating 25% of all US oil production. This didn't bode well for the vision Lou had, and on top of the budding business prospects growing around him every day, his own computer company was failing badly, as was his marriage. 
The couple had bought a summer cabin in the Kennecott Valley, very much near McCarthy. Lou found himself spending more and more time out there. This way, he could be alone and have some semblance of the life that he wanted. Having lived in California, Lou Hastings had actually volunteered to clean oil-soaked animals that were washing up on the coast from any oil spills. He resented the substance and everything that it represented. Money, wealth, pollution. Not long after moving to Anchorage and discovering the booming economy from the pending pipeline, Lou decided he had one option, attack the oil line and destroy it before it could ever be used. As his life crumbled apart, Lou retreated to the Kennecott cabin, where he spent the better part of a year planning this attack. According to a psychiatric report, Hastings was disturbed by the population growth an influx of money into the state and determined the best way to interrupt this was to destroy the pipeline, thus cut off Alaska's wealth and consequent growth. Chris Richards, 29, lived in a very modest cabin that had no modern appliances, no running water of any kind. Chris worked as a construction worker throughout the summers, like many Alaskan citizens, and collected unemployment checks and food stamps through the winter to make ends meet. Chris was a very simple guy. He'd lived in McCarthy for some time and was known as a good guy amongst his peers. On the morning of March 1st, Chris was lounging around his cabin, preparing for breakfast for himself. Through his back door, he could see Lou Hastings approaching through the trees, one of his local neighbors that lived in the area. Chris was preparing for breakfast over a fire, so everything was hot and delicate and required more attention than his normal range would. When Chris got his breakfast to a point that he could turn away from it, he looked back to shout a hello to his neighbor, Lou. Before he could speak, though, something struck his right cheek, shattering his glasses into pieces right there on his face. He ducked instinctually, drawing his face behind one hand, when something else glanced off the top of his head. Chris looked up now and saw Lou stepping into his cabin with a rifle in hand. The two men began struggling back and forth, grappling for the weapon and striking each other. Stop, what the hell are you doing? Chris screamed, yanking on the gun. Look, Chris, you're already dead, Lou said, calm as stone. If you'll just quit fighting, I'll make it easy for you, finish you off quick. Blood continued to pour down Chris's face. He realized Lou had already likely shot him at least once, and the wound was worse than he thought. Adrenaline was keeping him upright. Now he needed to get away. He glanced back and caught sight of a kitchen knife resting by the drain of the sink, the one that he used to prep his breakfast with, the breakfast that was burning on the stove behind him. Rage fumed up inside Chris, and he let go of the rifle with one hand and took the knife and buried it into Lou's shoulder. Maybe I'll make it easy on you, Chris said, as he yanked the bloodstained blade out of the wound. Lou grumbled, made sounds only a wounded man can make, and just as Chris stabbed him once again in the right leg. This one wasn't as deep though, but it still opened up a wound throughout Lou's jeans. Chris wasted no time. He took the momentary distraction the knife had brought him and disappeared through the open back door, only wearing a t-shirt, corduroy pants, and a single slipper. He wouldn't last long in the brutal icy temperatures, however. This was it though the beginning of Lou Hastings' onslaught. It was supposed to start with Chris Richards, someone who was a bit of a hermit and didn't have any close neighbors. Chris was a young, harmless guy who didn't have much in the way of an outside life, so didn't frequent the mail pickups or the social get-togethers. He was supposed to be an easy target, but proved more crafty than Lou had given him credit for. While Chris escaped, Lou took a moment to reload his rifle a 223 caliber Ruger Mini-14 and began to try to treat his own wounds. This was a suicide mission. He knew that and incorporated it into his plan, but this was way too soon to be wounded. There were 20 more people to murder and Lou needed to be intact in order to do that. Most, if not every citizen in McCarthy had a gun of some kind. Lou needed to keep the element a surprise before the killing turned into an open firefight. His plan hinged on everyone being dead, not just one or two of them. But alas, even Lou's smoldering corpse would turn up by the end. 
Meanwhile, Chris barreled through three quarters of a mile of snowy backcountry, up a steep hill, until he reached his nearest neighbor, which was an unoccupied cabin. Chris didn't hesitate to break in and hide inside the building, listening for his would-be killer in the forest. When no one came stalking out of the trees, Chris took to tearing the cabin apart for supplies. This was life or death, so he knew his neighbor would understand. That was, if he even survived. He found a parka, snow bibs, boots, and snowshoes. Now resting and properly outfitted, Chris knew he only needed to make it another quarter mile before he'd reach people, real occupied properties. As long as he kept Blue behind him and at a good distance, he should be able to make it into the heart of the town without being seen. The snowshoes would be a huge help in gaining ground and even covering his tracks. Just down the hill, Tim and Amy Nash were having a peaceful morning. Their cabin was situated on the trail that connected the villages of Kennecott and McCarthy. As the crisp morning air brightened underneath the sun, something else broke the air with much more tenacity. The newlyweds could hear it from the inside of their house, so Tim stepped out to see what the commotion was all about. It was Chris Richards, barreling through the snowy woodland, screaming for help. His head looked like it was painted with blood, as was his parka. Tim got his boots on and ran out to help him, and once he got a hold of him, hauled him right inside the house. Tim and Amy wasted no time in lending him a hand. Amy started treating his wounds. Tim got him something to drink, and Chris did his best to explain what happened. He had just been cooking breakfast when suddenly, Lou started taking pot shots at him with a rifle. They fought back and forth, and Chris got him with a knife. Now, here he was. Tim and Amy were in complete shock. Yes, they'd just seen Lou marching onto McCarthy just 20 minutes ago. Didn't think anything about it. Little did they know that he just started his killing spree, and their house was one of the next on the path. It came to Chris Richards then. He told the Nashes to arm themselves, then get down to the airstrip as quickly as possible. It was the only thing that made sense. It was midday, Tuesday, so Lou was likely working his way back, starting with those lounging at home until he got to the mail plane. Everyone would be standing in a line out in the snow, literally sitting ducks. Lou could lay down at 100 yards, pick them all off one by one in less than 20 seconds. They chose a different plan, however. Tim fired up their snow machine, hooked up a sled to the back, which they tucked Chris into. Tim and Amy hopped on the snowmobile and began roaring towards the airstrip. Tim white-knuckled the 12-gauge shotgun, packed full of buckshot. The first person they came upon was Gary Green, a local pilot who was cleaning snow from his airplane. Tim, Amy, and Chris came screaming into the parking lot, waving their arms over their heads. Gary came over immediately to see what the trouble was. They laid everything on him, from Chris's first initial encounter to his flight through the trees. Gary's eyes were wide, face ghost white, simply nodding along to everything they said. As near as we can tell, he's gonna kill the other outliers before circling back to shoot up everyone waiting for their mail, Chris explained. No, Gary said. No, 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 I, I saw Lou walking too. He wasn't headed for your place. He was going to the Heglins, I'm sure of it, Gary said. Everyone went silent at this development. The Heglins, the Postmasters. That was the other place to hang out on a Tuesday. If someone missed the airplane, they could get it later at the makeshift post office. These were two of the most populated places on a Tuesday, and Gary was certain that he'd seen Lou marching in that exact direction. Now they needed to come up with another plan, and quickly. There was only one thing that made sense. Tim Nash would go check on the Heglins. Amy would continue on to the main office and warn everybody. And Gary would fire up his airplane to get Chris to the next town over and get medical treatment for his wounds. While Gary taxied onto the runway, he caught sight of something. It was Amy and Tim crashing through the forest together. There was no doubt about it. They were coming straight for the airplane. Worried that the situation had gotten worse and they needed help, he instructed Chris to wait with the plane at the end of the runway. Meanwhile, Gary hopped out and ran over to meet the fleeing couple. The story was now getting crazier. Tim had gone to the Heglins just as they planned. He took a stray path that wasn't as trafficked, stayed out of sight to the best of his ability. 
When he came upon the cabin, he could tell that something was wrong. The front door was open and looked like it had been kicked in. Slowly and cautiously, Tim slipped through the front mail room into the Heglin's residence. Right away, he could smell the strong concentration of gun smoke and powder. Someone had rapidly discharged a firearm within that building. They'd done so within the last few minutes as well. Blood streaked up and down the walls, but oddly enough, there weren't any bodies anywhere. It almost seemed like someone had taken preliminary measures to start cleaning up the scene. Bodies have seemed to be moved, and it looked like someone had even started mopping all the blood off the floor and countertops. Tim didn't know what to make of it, but he assumed anyone who was at the Heglins was dead. There was simply too much blood, too many holes in the walls for there to be any other outcome. He didn't see any tracks in the snow fleeing into the forest. Whatever happened in the Heglin home was contained. Then he heard it, footsteps along the back porch. Tim Nash had approached the Heglin home with complete caution. He had entered in total silence. Even now, after moving from room to room and standing in the kitchen, he hadn't made a sound. Tim knew that there was a killer lurking somewhere in town, and now seeing the blood and hearing the footsteps, he knew this person was close. Through the open back door, Tim caught a glimpse of Lou Hastings, casually pacing from one end of the porch to the other, as if he were waiting for more neighbors to show up. The Mini-14 lay in his arms, across his chest, ready to reap more life from the quiet, sleepy citizens of McCarthy. Tim chose to take matters into his own hands, literally. Armed with that 12 gauge, he shouldered the shotgun and pulled the trigger, but did so a second too soon. The buckshot lodged mostly into the wall and door frame and just barely grazing Lou. Lou shouldered his own rifle and returned fire, struck Tim in the leg with a round from his 223. After the initial barrage, Tim used the shotgun to create some distance, housing down the back wall of the house and forcing Lou to take cover. Once he did, Tim turned and despite the hole in his leg, took off at a full sprint back to town. He needed to let everyone know that the Heglins were now dead. Maxine Edwards was also dead on the property as well. Now that they confirmed Lou's plan of murdering the whole community, they solidified their plan. Gary would get his plane in the air, where he would make radio contact with other planes in the area and get a message out for help. He would also carry Chris to the next town for medical treatment, as he'd been struck by multiple rounds. Gary climbed back into the plane and got her up in the air, just in time to make a chance spotting of Lou, who was slinking along the unused dog sled trail. He'd backtracked all the way from the Heglins, rifle in hand, to finish what he'd started. The issue was, Gary was already in the air. He had no way of warning Tim and Amy. We're standing out in the open, down on the airstrip. Hastings and the dog sled trail were hidden by a thick brush and a huge mound of plowed snow. So he had plenty of time to slowly crest that snow pile and get into a position. Gary and Chris looked down in horror as Hastings laid down and shouldered the rifle and opened fire on the exposed newlyweds. They went down quickly didn't even have time to react before Lou popped up and closed in with his rifle. He'd taken his first shots at about 250 yards, so when he reached 100 yards, he brought the rifle up and shot both Tim and Amy two more times. Once he was within 50 yards, he shot them both again, this time right in the head, execution style. Gary and Chris couldn't believe what they just witnessed as the airplane did a final lap of the valley on its way to the next town. Gary made contact with the mail plane, told them about the situation. Meanwhile, Chris watched as Lou dragged the dead bodies of Tim and Amy up the snowbank. Lou didn't stop with the killing of Tim and Amy though. He stashed both of their bodies, just as he did at the Heglin residence, and laid in waiting with his rifle. The hours were slipping by, the bodies were stacking up. Whoever was left, would soon be congregated right in front of him, right here at the airstrip. A lone engine cut out over the frosty mountain air when Harley King came right over the ridge on his snow machine. Donna Byram rode in the back, being dragged along in a sled, much like Chris Richards had earlier with the Nashes. It was common for one local to pick up another if they found them on a walk, 
as half the population regularly zipped around on the snowmobiles. Harley and Donna had no clue what was going on in McCarthy, or the trouble that had befallen their friends. They rode parallel to the airstrip, as Donna looked around for the usual smiling faces, or any sign of the mail plane. She saw something else instead, though. Lou Hastings, stalking along the snow ridge a few hundred yards away. When they came upon the site where the Nashes had been shot and killed together, the bodies were gone, but what looked like gallons of blood painted the area. There was even a little trail from where the kill had clearly been dragged off. Donna thought to herself how strange it was for someone to be shooting animals on the airstrip, and yet stranger, they would butcher it right there on the landing strip. That's when the first few bullets started to hit the snow around them, and then began to rattle off the snow machine beneath Harley. Reports cut through the air, and Donna was sure of it. Lou Hastings was shooting at them from across the clearing. Based on the blood, he must have already ambushed someone, right there where they're riding. One of those bullets struck Harley, and Donna knew because he jerked the snow machine in every direction before regaining control. It looked as if he'd been shot in the leg, and based on the loud bark of the rifle, Donna assumed the bones in Harley's leg were likely shattered from that impact. She would be correct. With a bum leg, which happens during snowmobiling, driving the machine becomes a difficult task. However, Harley punched the gas and sent the machine roaring for cover. This is when Donna got clipped and found soft flesh of her shoulder beneath the coats and parka. She did her best to hang onto the sled as she and Harley struggled to get out of the gunfire. It didn't matter though, as the high speed of the snow machine and Harley's broken leg got the better of him. He lost all control of the vehicle, with Harley and Donna were thrown into the snow, blood leaking from their wounds as they realized their fate. Donna wasted no time. She sprung up, did her best to drag Harley over to the snowmobile and load him into the back. She looked up just in time to see Lou hustle over from his place on the ridge, start jogging over to them, rifle across his chest. Donna froze in that moment, petrified in fear, as she stared at the man who was about to kill her. Her breath started to fade as she accepted death out there in the tundra. Hey, Harley wheezed. Hey, you gotta go. Donna turned and tried to blink away the tears. She remembered where she was and what she was doing and went back to loading a friend onto the tilted snow machine. No, Harley said, shaking his head. Don't bother, your arm is shot. I can't move. You're never gonna get me back on this thing. What do we do? Donna asked. You gotta run. Get to Les and Flo's house, use the radio. Get the law out here as quickly as you can. Donna didn't move, and soon, they could both hear loose footsteps crunching through the snow. I'm serious, I can't move my legs. Save yourself and see if you can save anyone else. Go, Donna, go, Harley said, pointing down the nearest trail. It just happened to be the trail that connected the Heglin's house to the airstrip. I'm sorry, Donna breathed before turning and hustling into the spruce woodland. Just as she disappeared through the thicket, Lou came over the last snowdrift, separating him from his prey. As Donna ran, she could hear muffled voices, then two sharp gunshots. She started to sprint, careless of the bullet hole in her arm, until she spotted the Heglin's house up ahead. Like Tim, though, she could tell something was off right away. Bullet holes in the walls, the front door was kicked in, Nothing good would be waiting for her inside, so instead, Donna simply ran around back and hid behind a nearby greenhouse. As she caught her breath and squeezed the bloody mess under her sleeve to help staunch the bleeding, she could hear Lou's footsteps coming into the clearing. He stomped up the steps, crossed the porch, and then into the house. He went from room to room, then back outside, down the stairs, and then started exploring the property. He was approaching the greenhouse when he stopped, yanked a tarp off the snowmobile, then fired up the engine. Donna couldn't believe her luck when she heard Lou drive off into the wilderness. He'd only been a few feet from discovering her. To put it simply, Lou's plan was coming apart at the seams. When he envisioned a simple task, it turned out to be far more work than he realized. The residents of McCarthy were tough, 
rugged folks. This wasn't a secret. He hadn't accounted for all their hardened ability to fight back, as half of those that he encountered immediately put up a struggle. The citizens had pieced the plan together pretty well. Lou was going to start with the locals of McCarthy and Kennecott, picking off the outliers and then the male crew exactly as Chris and Tim had surmised. From there, Lou was going to hijack the mail plane, kill the pilot, and fly 80 miles west of McCarthy, land at a pump station where the pipeline intersected. He'd rig the plane to take off with no one at the controls, which would hopefully create a distraction. After that, he would use the fuel truck to ram into the pipeline, all while spraying bullets to the windshield in an effort to rupture the pipe. He hoped the cold weather would congeal the oil, causing minimal environmental damage, and the tanker would explode and his body would be charred beyond all recognition. In Lou's mind, this would conjure a truly fearful narrative and even create the illusion that there was still a killer on the loose. Hopefully, that effect would lower interest to tourism in Alaska, as well as less incoming business due to the horrific murders. It was all for the sake of preserving the integrity of the state, as well as the environment that Hastings so desperately idolized. From the start though, Lou had botched the mission. Now with so much time gone by, and so many residents of McCarthy knowing what was going on and scattered to the woodland, Lou's options were limited. If he had any hope to escape or finish his plan of sabotaging the pipeline, he needed to get out of town immediately. Hastings assumed the local authorities would respond in a fixed wing aircraft, something that could hold more men and more weapons, so he wanted to get away from the McCarthy airfield. He came upon the Heglin house again, where he found there wasn't anyone there, decided to use their snow machine to disappear into the Alaskan backcountry. The police didn't respond in a fixed wing airplane though, instead launched an unmarked helicopter to deliver a quick response time. It also kept them closer to the ground, offered more maneuverability, and wouldn't give them away as law enforcement. They spotted Hastings heading west on the snowmobile, tearing through the forest. The troopers found a clearing, landed, and surrounded the fleeing snowmobile. Hastings stopped the machine, hopped off and waved. He offered no resistance whatsoever. He screamed over the whack of the helicopter blades. Thank God you're here. Put your weapons down, an officer hollered, pointing to Hastings' rifle. Lou unslung the Ruger and let it fall to the snow. I'm getting out of McCarthy. Someone went berserk back there and started shooting up the whole town, Hastings explained. The officers furrowed a brow and talked amongst themselves. What's your name? They asked him. Chris Richards, Lou Hastings lied. He was pretending to be his first would-be victim in an attempt to throw off the police. He knew none of the responding troopers actually knew what any of the residents looked like, so he decided to take a gamble. It didn't work. The troopers already had a description radioed in, to which Lou matched every part of. They kept their weapons on him and cuffed him and loaded him into the chopper, take back to the station. Only after they were in the air did Lou say, you got me, I'm your man. Lou Hastings was something of an eco-terrorist. Even the prosecuting attorney in the case referred to him as a, a very bright guy, a nerdy academic whose wig is on probably a little too tight. There's a lot of parallels to this guy, Kaczynski, that's the Unabomber. Like Kaczynski, Hastings had fled from his relatively normal life in the city for this idyllic existence in the wilderness. When they found out that this daydream was unobtainable due to some villainous political or corporate organization, they turned to violence to create a conspiracy of fear in order to protect something they considered sacred. In both cases, the sacred belonging was nature. Instead of using bombs though, like the Unabomber, Lou settled on the Ruger Mini-14 and a silenced 22 caliber pistol. The pistol is what he shot Chris Richards with, which is why the wounds weren't fatal and why he couldn't hear them being discharged. One of Hastings' public defenders was quoted saying, if you really distill it down, Mr. Hastings thought he was gonna be the savior of the Alaskan wilderness.
This episode is sponsored by the comments section. Um, actually, how you pronounce that word back there, it's not actually pronounced like that. I, I, <laughs> I have a bachelor's degree, and so I like to use it in the comment section to correct people because, well, <laughs> you can't see me, but I'm flipping my hair back because I'm so fucking smart. <laughs> yes, yes, queen. Gracias. <laughs> yes, we'll take more cheese dip, please. Uh, I've heard these stories before on other channels. This is ridiculous. Like, uh, repeat stories. Do you even care? Do you even check with the thousands of narrators out there every time you get a story? Why don't you check with the thousands of narrators to see? Your stories are old. I've heard them before. I'm fucking sick of this shit. I don't know why you guys just don't use new stories. I know this channel's AI. All the AI's gonna take over. Gonna take over and take all the lands from us. And now they're taking the narrators away from us too. I, I, I just discovered it today, but I know damn well this is, a, this is an AI channel. <laughs>